Welcome to this lesson about some basics of the carbon cycle. The reason we're interested in the carbon cycle is because carbon is a component of carbon dioxide, which is an important greenhouse gas, and therefore the natural and human processes that influence exchanges of carbon with the atmosphere influence the greenhouse effect, and therefore influence Earth's climate. The carbon cycle is complicated. People spend careers exploring even just pieces of it. Here, we're gonna look at the carbon cycle broadly within a systems dynamics framework and examine stocks and flows of carbon, primarily to and from the atmosphere. In this lesson, we're gonna focus on flows of carbon that are not directly related to human activities. We're gonna see how much carbon moves around every year, where it goes, and how it gets there. We'll spend some time with the seasonal cycles of atmospheric carbon dioxide from a stock and flow perspective to get some practice with that. Here's a version of the carbon cycle on Earth. To orient you, the numbers in parentheses indicate the number of gigatons of carbon in a particular place. A gigaton is a billion tons. So, for example, the atmosphere has about 830 billion tons of carbon in it. Looking at the opposite corner, the deep ocean has about 37,000 billion tons of carbon in it. That's a lot more than the atmosphere. All the plants on land have a mere 550 tons, but don't worry too much about the exact numbers. You'll find slightly different numbers on different versions of the carbon cycle, but the comparisons should be pretty similar. The yellow numbers are flows, with units of gigatons of carbon per year. So for example, photosynthesis on land takes about 120 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. Another example on the other side of the diagram shows that the oceans release about 90 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere each year. The red numbers are flows of carbon associated with human activities, which will be in a different lesson. So first, we'll take a look at the most important processes by which the atmosphere exchanges carbon with biology on land. You're probably familiar with the basic processes of photosynthesis and respiration. During photosynthesis, plants use energy from the sun to combine carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients, which are things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And in the process, they produce organic matter and release oxygen to the atmosphere. The key thing to notice is that the source of CO2 for photosynthesis is the atmosphere. That's where the plants are getting their carbon. When the plants respire or decay, or animals respire or decay, the organic matter recombines with oxygen and the CO2, water, and nutrients are released along with some energy. This back and forth exchange is happening all the time. Most of the carbon that's drawn out of the atmosphere by plants each year goes back into the atmosphere fairly quickly. Just a tiny amount of organic matter gets buried every year and sent into long-term storage in rocks. Notice the magnitude of the yearly exchange of carbon between land biology and the atmosphere. 120 billion tons of carbon gets transferred in both directions each year. And the other big player that exchanges carbon with the atmosphere on fairly short timescales is the oceans. Gases are constantly exchanging across the boundary between the air and the water, going back and forth, depending on the relative pressures of those gases in the atmosphere compared to the ocean. Some CO2 goes into the ocean where marine plants can use it to photosynthesize. Just like biology on land, when the marine organisms die, they mostly decay and release the carbon back to the water. All of the photosynthesis in the oceans is happening close to the surface where there's light available, and much of the carbon involved in biology close to the surface sticks around there and gets recycled. But there's a leak of organic matter from the surface to the deep ocean as some portion of dead stuff sinks down through the water. And it's partly because of that leak that the deep ocean has a lot of carbon stored down there. But it doesn't stay in the deep ocean forever, because the ocean mixes, so circulation eventually brings carbon-rich water back to the surface where it exchanges with the atmosphere again. The mixing, though, takes several hundred to a thousand years, approximately, so the deep ocean is a pretty good place to store carbon on those timescales, as occurred during the cold, warm climate cycles of the past million years. And last, uh, notice here, too, that the oceans exchange a lot of carbon with the atmosphere each year with about 90 billion tons going back and forth between them. We're gonna to have to add to the carbon cycle figure because there are some geologic processes that both draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and return it to the atmosphere. Volcanoes 
add a little bit of CO2 to the atmosphere when they erupt. And the weathering of rocks, which involves CO2 and water, takes it out of the atmosphere. We mentioned there's a little bit of leakage of organic matter, which gets buried every year. And older rocks with carbon in them get exposed each year, returning that carbon to the atmosphere. These flows are tiny compared to the massive exchanges happening between the atmosphere and the biosphere and the atmosphere and the oceans. They're far less than a gigaton per year. One important thing to note here, which we'll get to later, is that we've increased the rate of flow of carbon from the fossil carbon pool to the atmosphere by extracting and burning fossil fuels. Another thing to note here is that geologic burial is also an important option to consider for mitigation efforts. Can we purposefully increase the flow of carbon into long-term storage underground? This is another potential place to intervene. Now we're going to work in a little more detail with stock and flow. Here's the atmospheric CO2 data from Mauna Loa again, showing the upward trend, but more important for us here, the seasonal wiggles that happen. So what's your expectation? In which season do the little peaks occur? When do the little valleys occur? What do you think? Here's the pattern over the course of a year. These are data from the Northern Hemisphere. So consider seasons in the Northern Hemisphere for this. The peak turns out to be in May, which is springtime in the Northern Hemisphere. And the valley turns out to be in October, which is autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. So earlier we saw that the atmosphere exchanges a lot of carbon with plants every year through photosynthesis, which is an outflow from the atmosphere, and respiration, which is inflow to the atmosphere. But from this figure, we can tell that the inflow and outflow clearly are not in balance every second of the year. At some times of the year, the rate of respiration exceeds the rate of photosynthesis, and so CO2 goes up. That's what's going on from the autumn all the way through the winter to the spring. Then photosynthesis cranks up and bypasses respiration, and we get a net drawdown of CO2 out of the atmosphere during the growing season from spring to fall. There are two times of year when inflow actually equals outflow. One's at the peak, and the other is at the valley. As an aside, this pattern happens in the southern hemisphere too. You can look up those data if you want to. Before you do though, make a prediction for yourself about what you think it's going to look like. Let's look at this from one other perspective, because dealing with balances of flows just isn't easy. This is another way of thinking about the situation. In this figure, we're looking at inflow and outflow combined. We're looking at the net amount of how much CO2 either goes into the atmosphere or leaves the atmosphere each month of the year. Just to get oriented, look at January. During the month of January, the atmosphere gains enough CO2 to equal a little less than one part per million. In February, the atmosphere gains some more, about the equivalent of half a part per million. Then for each month up until May, the net flow is positive, going into the atmosphere. Then in May, there's virtually no net change. The value of inflow plus outflow is close to zero. That's the month when things turn around. Then in June, the net flow is out of the atmosphere. During that month, the atmosphere loses about a part per million. The biggest monthly loss comes in August, during which the atmosphere loses a bit more than two parts per million. And then we get back to a balance of flows. The blue line crosses zero again by October. This is a difficult graph. The main point here is that the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up when inflow exceeds outflow. That's the positive numbers on this vertical axis. It goes down when outflow exceeds inflow. And it stays the same when inflow and outflow are equal. That's when the value here is zero in May and in October. This is just an example that happens to be of natural processes changing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We could apply this line of thinking to other processes too, like the comparison of CO2 inflows to the atmosphere from human activities and the extra outflow that the land and ocean take up for us. That's a topic for a different time. So that's a short tour of some of the key processes involved in the carbon cycle and some of the key processes that influence atmospheric carbon dioxide over short, medium, and longer timescales. We also took a look at the example of seasonal cycles in atmospheric carbon dioxide, which result from seasonal imbalances in inflow and outflow.
Sometimes inflow winds, sometimes outflow winds, and the atmospheric CO2 concentration responds. Keep thinking about flow balances whenever you're looking at a stock of something in the climate system changing over time. 